Hello, hello. I have notes today, which is kind of a bad idea for me because I have a tendency to ramble, so... Because I have notes, prepare for a lot of awkward pausing. Now today I'm going to be drawing Winnie because it's October, my favorite month, or it used to be. I think it still is, <laughs> but that's kind of the theme of today's episode, I guess. And because I just like drawing Winnie as a sort of a mascot of the channel in a weird way. Now, the idea of the picture that I'm going to be drawing is uh, sort of like an older Winnie that you've been growing up alongside for a number of years. You've both been through a lot of changes, but you're both still together, for whatever your reasons. It can be romantic, or it can be friendly, or maybe she's taking you into the woods to kill you. I, I don't know. I don't know what you're into. That is entirely up to you. Something I was talking about on stream yesterday, actually was the idea that almost all of the stuff that I do is uh, oriented around the idea of projecting yourself onto whatever the work is. It doesn't matter if it's writing, it doesn't matter if it's like a video essay, just... I always try to leave it open-ended enough that whatever is going through your head, you can project onto the page or onto the canvas. So, sometimes I succeed more than others, though. Okay, so, today's video is going to be sort of a podcast. Which is funny, because these videos typically are always podcasts. But, at the same time, it's something I've always thought about doing. I've considered podcasts in the past. Pat and Paige recommended that I do one with them a long time ago. But I honestly didn't do that at the time, because... One, it was a little bit over my head in terms of just organizing things, because I had too many things going on. And second, because honestly, I just didn't trust either one of them. Especially Paige. I did not trust Paige at all in regards to, like, scheduling or anything like that. And, uh, that, in hindsight, that lack of trust was very well founded, founded. I am glad I did not try to do that. Or else I would probably be stuck holding some sort of empty bag at this point. Uh, I still consider doing a podcast from time to time as a way to make money. But I also don't really have much of a theme behind it. And that's kind of important. Like, most podcasts are about, you know... Uh, serial killers, or cooking, or uh, self-improvement, or something like that. And while a lot of my videos do tend to harp on the same general ideas, I don't really have an ongoing theme. I guess I could do something like talk to other artists about the things that they do, and their experiences, and things like that. I don't know. It's one of those things that I've thought about in the past, but I don't really have a strong theme, I think. If you have some ideas, feel free to leave them in the comments. Or just keep them to yourselves quietly and conceal them in your heart forever, where I won't find them. That will be very helpful. <laughs> Anyways, um... Uh, people have told me in the past that X or Y is a great idea. Uh, all the time. Like, for example, the podcast idea is one of them. Uh, Dungeons and Dragons is another good one. Uh, I've done some things in regards to that in the past. Um, streaming is one of those things, although streaming does have some payoff. It's not like it's it can be something that is a primary source of revenue for me. Um, I've seen people that have smaller amounts of viewers that say that they actually make way more than I do. And I'm not really sure how. It has something to do with Twitch just really, really liking people that do nothing but stream nonstop every single day for their entire lives. And even if you miss a few days, Twitch will just say, mm -mm -mm, can't do that, can't have your own life. And they will throttle your income rate way down, like as far as the advertising goes. And uh, as a result, you are punished, and your ability to have a life just goes away. So, you can make a lot of money streaming, but be prepared for you to be effectively a living TV channel. And you're just not allowed to do anything else with your life. Which uh, is not something that I want to do. So, personally, I do like streaming, but it is definitely something that I would always consider to be like a side hustle. Something that you can make a few hundred dollars doing. Every year, in some cases. <laughs> if you're lucky, maybe uh, once a month. Uh, but only if you're lucky. But that's life in general, I guess. It's sort of a series of experiments and trying different things. 
When you do try something, though, it should be something that you enjoy doing. There's been lots of things that people have suggested that I should try to do that I have no interest in, or it's only a lateral thing that I sort of think about. It's not something I'm really that excited about. Uh, that should be true of everything that you do in life. Uh, even whenever you're growing up, you're told, of course, to, what's it saying? If you do what you love, you never work a day in your life. And that's definitely true. Um, if you are working and it's something that you really enjoy doing, then it doesn't really feel like work, and it almost feels like you're getting away with something. Now, that said, I feel like it doesn't matter what you do, if you're forced into doing it, it can ruin the experience. It's sort of like having a favorite song, and then having the broad idea of making it your ringtone. And that song will very quickly stop being your favorite song. Because it will recontextualize what that sound is, and you might even start to hate it depending on what exactly is happening in your life at the time. It's also the same as like giving one of your favorite songs to someone that at the moment you are dating or you care about, and then something happens, and that relationship is recontextualized. They may even become an enemy. You know, you have no idea. And from that point forward, that song will be something that you hate hearing because it will just remind you of that problem. So you have to be very careful about also bringing things that you love into your life as work. It's one of the reasons why typically partners, uh, whether, you know, it's wife, husband, or just whatever, uh, friends, very close friends, one of the reasons why you typically don't want to work with them, because that can create huge problems down the line. You have to be very careful. And that just comes to, it's, there's no general rule for it, it just comes down to wisdom and application. But, you know, <laughs> life is just a series of doing that. It's just experiments. Some things I am interested in, but they're just so unknown that they become more terrifying than enjoyable. And the, the podcast thing is one of those things, in a sense. Because while I like talking at the screen, the idea of needing to do that every week and always have a topic, and it becomes work and I always have to be engaging, and I'm doing this on my own, probably. I probably am not going to have a co-host to rely on. That's terrifying. And it is terrifying enough that it eclipses the idea of enjoying it and actually making money doing it. Assuming that I would make money at all. It is quite possible that I would host a po podcast and then make one penny for every month or every week. You, know, you just don't know. D&D uh, &D is sort of the same thing as well. It's been recommended to me that I would be able to DM or GM a game for people and uh, host that on the channel. And yeah, I'm sure that a lot of people would enjoy that, because people associate me with like storytelling and so on. But that is a lot to expect of me, for someone that has almost no experience actually doing D&D &D or any sort of tabletop. So the idea of getting into that is terrifying. And it is more terrifying than it is enjoyable. So as a result, if I did start doing it, it would have to be something that I just barely get my little toe into. And then move on from there. Which I have done in the past, but I just haven't moved on to the next step yet. Something else, as an example, are the YouTube shorts that I've been doing lately. Because it was suggested to me, hey... You have these drawings, you could just host the time lapses that you've already done as, you know, the art gripes, like the thing that you're watching now, and just turn them into shorts. And I thought, well, those time lapses wouldn't really make a good uh, YouTube short because you can't see the whole drawing. But I figured out uh, Clip Studio Paint enables you to time lapse record the canvas itself, as opposed to just uh, screen recording, like I'm doing with Bandicam here. Then you export that, and conveniently it exports it up to a maximum of 60 seconds. So I'm able to take that, remove like the first frame or so, uh, change the speed to 105%, and that is just enough that I can fit that entire thing into a YouTube short. Works very well. I actually really like the format. I like making those, and they're fairly easy to make, aside from the fact that I have to make a whole drawing, which can take several days. So I tried the shorts. Then, 
I had the genius idea to go check the monetization of the shorts and see how they, they were doing. This was a bad idea. Because I looked, because I had been... I had gotten a payout from YouTube for the first time in years and years, because I, you know, I just don't have monetization on YouTube. Back whenever I started the Patreon, that was one of the things that I promised. That I would just turn off monetization on YouTube because I despised YouTube. Because they just refused to reward artists for their work. So as a result, I just didn't bother having them on. In hindsight, I would... I should not have done that. Because that's a lot of money that I've lost out on over the years that could have prepared me for to have a better life now. Uh, it's definitely not something I should have done. Uh, I'm still... I, I don't regret it that much, because I do like the fact that people were able to rely on me to just provide content that didn't have lots of front-loaded ads for years and years. Uh, any advertisements... Any advertisements that you see on my older videos are from larger companies stealing my content. Like the Naruto video is probably a good idea behind that. It's probably my most video viewed video at this point, to my chagrin. But I've never made a single cent off of it. But it probably has advertisements on it, specifically because um, the parent company, Toei or whatever, uh, stole the content. Just because it technically has uh, you know anime footage inside of it. Even though it's completely transformative, and it follows all the criteria for you know United States copyright, blah 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 blah. They don't care. Yeah, they're they're, they're going to steal it if they can. Um, the modern videos, though, I've gotten to where I turn on uh, monetization on the recent stuff. This video that you're watching probably should have monetization on it. And if I remember, maybe I'll put a video or advertisement right about here. Or maybe not. <laughs> maybe I was lying. Um, but anyways, yeah. I tried the shorts... And that instantly gave me anxiety. Because whenever I was looking for all the money that I had supposedly made to earn YouTube, you know, uh, sending me those payments, I realized the shorts were not w what was making the money. Uh, all that money had come from the uh, video essay that I'd done. I think specifically on Tears of the Kingdom. The shorts, I looked to see how much money the shorts had been making. Almost none of them made any money. It was like one penny for every video that I made. It doesn't matter if it had 12,000 views. It didn't matter if it had 30,000 or even like 100,000 or something. The most money I had made on any of them at all, I think, was a little bit over $1. So that was just devastating to me. The idea that I put so much effort and so many hours into trying this new thing, this new format, as a means of trying to keep engaged with my audience and just try to do a good job. And it was rewarded with a spit in the face, effectively. So I decided, okay, I will try to work through this. It doesn't feel good, but I'll try to move on to something else. It's been a long time since I've updated Shark Robot, uh, specifically my t-shirts, um, uh, specifically because... I had had such a bad time the last two or three years, and so many projects had fallen through, it felt very disingenuous to try to make t-shirt designs for someone that's not producing content, is what it felt like to me. Like, I'm not doing a good job, so why would anyone want to buy a t-shirt from someone who's like a defunct creator, effectively? That's what it felt like. So I have recently I've been uh, trying to do t-shirt designs uh, to sort of, you know, just... Uh, uh, create some ideas out of the content that I had made in prior years. So some of the like jokes from like older videos that you may have picked up on over the years should be showing up in those. But I made the mistake of saying, all right, I want to make at least five of these things and I want to have them done before I leave on a trip in early November. This will be my first international trip. So it's been, you know, Creating a lot of anxiety for that reason, because it's brand new, it's travel, there's a lot of money involved. Um, I'm going to have to be working while I'm on the trip as a way to write off the trip so that I can actually take it in the first place. So that's another element that I have to worry about. So I had to buy a lot of expensive equipment so that I could actually have like a, the ability to take video, like actual video, uh, while I'm on the trip. 
So that's another concern. Just lots of things piling up, in other words. No need to get into the details of it. Um, so trying to work against a, a timetable that I had set for myself just gave me more anxiety. So that didn't feel good at all. Um, and I kept waking up and just instantly having anxiety as a result. So I decided I'm going to step away. I'm going to put aside that timetable. I'm going to take a little bit of break from work itself and just try to relax. So I tried to do that. And um, to that end, typically I found as I've gotten older, used to I could relax in pretty much any way I wanted to. Uh, I didn't really like spending too much time around other people. But as I've gotten older, I found that I really do need to have the presence of other people that I feel some sort of connection with in some way. Like, um, what I've been doing lately is watching stuff on my Discord with other people. Which is kind of hard to do in the middle of the night, because no, no one's awake. Uh, for example, whenever I stream on Twitch... I will look over to the side, and if I see that if I see that view counter tick down, you know, I, if I'm if I'm like at 150 people, and it goes from 150 down to 100, it doesn't matter what the rational explanation is, like bots or because that happens, like it'll go up to like it'll, it'll go up by 20 and then drop by 20 all the time. It doesn't matter. Um, but the rational explanation is people are leaving because it's time to go to bed because it's like past midnight it makes perfect sense there's no reason to worry about that but even knowing that my reptile brain will see that and just go panic 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 like you're not doing a good job you're not being entertaining people are leaving because you know why would they stick around for someone that's not entertaining them uh so as a result that creates more anxiety i hate that feeling but uh, streaming over Discord, just watching things together, there's nothing to worry about. There's no monetization. There's no need to worry about view counts. But if you hop in Discord and then no one shows up, that also feels bad. And people can, people typically on Discord will show up and you know mute themselves and just sit back and watch the same way that would with a Twitch stream, for example. And um, you know, kind of just chill out and listen to the background, or they might even mute it, you know, just to be there in general. So uh, you can have this sensation of watching something, laughing at something funny, and no one else laughs. And uh, even something as simple as that can trigger that same anxiety. Because it is that little reminder that you're actually completely alone. Which is also not true. But remember, reptile brain. This is how anxiety works. So I kept, I got into that cycle, and it just kept eating away at me. And during the process of this, I tried to work some, because I knew I'd need to work. I need to get something done. So I would open up Clip Studio Paint, look at these t-shirt designs, start trying to draw, and I would get like five minutes in, and it was just devastating me. It was just really just dragging me down. Uh, so I tried to instead just write, uh, write new scripts. But all the things that I was doing, I realized, require so much work, like the new scripts, I would have to write the script, I would have to edit it, I would, like, this, that process can take weeks sometimes, depending on what it is. Uh, gather the materials for it, either find a new editor or try to edit it myself, and just go through production, and all that stuff would take like just an obscene amount of time. Uh, same thing with even a lot of drawings, the same problem occurs. Uh, the t-shirts especially would take a huge amount of time, because not only do you have to just do a standard drawing, it has to be a perfect drawing. You can't do what I'm doing like in this picture. This Winnie drawing, one of the reasons why I decided to do it is because I decided I'm going to make a messy drawing. If you're looking at it and you're like, oh, there's lots of mistakes and the line work isn't as like smooth or whatever, uh, it's because I decided I'm not going to care. Like, I'm doing this for me. Like, this is just something I want to enjoy doing. Um, so I, I realized that all the things that I could do as work were just huge major projects. Or they were just streaming. And I had had I've been burned so badly on the idea of making YouTube shorts or uh, streaming because I really don't make that much money off streaming as well that everything felt like it was just a waste of time like everything that I was trying to do was failing none of the effort that I was putting into all the work that I was doing was paying off and it just you know it just it felt like 
it was very empty and I was hitting a wall. So everything just resulted in more anxiety. Plus, I realized over time that some of it was, there was something about the cold that was actually triggering it as well. Which is very strange. Because I would feel like I was getting better, and then all of a sudden I would just have this wave of... It's not even anxiety. It was almost like this combination of... Like, sometimes it would feel more like sadness. Sometimes it would feel more like anxiety. Sometimes it wouldn't feel like anything but just being cold. And sometimes it would feel like a sort of nausea. And it was around that time that I realized... I'm probably sick with something. There's probably something I'm carrying with me. Because I had had like some digestive issues the prior days as well, I think. Uh, so I thought to myself, there must just be a lot going on with me internally as well. Because I had to remind myself, these kinds of feelings aren't just feelings. They're not just mental. A lot of the times, as I've told you guys many times in the past, it's also chemical. So I decided uh, I'm going to take a bunch of, I'm going to take a shitload of D3, the stuff you make whenever you're exposed to the sun. Because I've been waking up um, uh, in the middle of the night recently. And because I'm trying to adjust my sleep schedule, so hopefully I will be timed correctly uh, for whenever I uh, travel internationally. I'm going to the UK, by the way. Uh, but whenever I'm over there, I want to make sure that my sleep is actually, you know, regulated correctly. So that I can actually wake up in the mornings and go to sleep at night. Uh, so my sleep had been very bad. I had been getting like three hours of sleep, waking up moving around for a little bit, and then falling asleep again for like another three hours, and I just felt miserable all the time. So I was treating my body badly, and also I was not getting <laughs> like the uh, vitamins that I needed and so on. So half of it was work, half of it was just biology. So I decided, enough of this, no more work, like just cold, just no more work. I'm going to wake up and do nothing. Not even going to associate it with work, not going to think about it. Uh, and I'm also going to try to treat myself better. I'm going to sleep as much as I need to, and I'm going to take the vitamins that I need so that I can actually get to the point where I'm actually stable enough to get back to work. Because I, oh, oh, one of the odd things about the cold is I started thinking, well, a lot of the horrible things that were happening to me a couple of years ago, I associate strongly with the cold, like uh, coffin shopping at an Amish uh uh, not village, but <laughs> there was a, a guy that made coffins. He was, you know, Amish, uh, and we didn't have the money to pay for my father's coffin, so I was uh, going there to try to figure out a way to pay for it. And But y you get what I'm saying. Uh, I have, like, this mental association now with cold equals, like, depression and bad things happening and so on. Um, and also, you know, lack of money, etc., so, just very panic-inducing in a weird way, and I didn't realize that. And uh, it, It's not that strong, but I think it was sort of there. Just one of those things you have to kind of think about from time to time. If it's there, it's subconscious. So I just decided to just, like, focus entirely on just sitting there. And in sitting there, I got a Gmail notification at some point that someone had reduced... I never get these emails. Uh, someone had re reduced the amount of money that they were donating per month from $5, which I appreciate definitely, to $1, which I still appreciate. But just that little bitty thing, that little bitty moment of $5 to $1 was just enough to trigger that part of my brain that's like you're doing a bad job. Like you're losing money every time that, like every single moment that you are not working, that you're not thinking about work. You're doing a bad job and everyone can tell and you know just those thoughts going through my head constantly uh so that was enough to like trigger it again so i just felt bad the entire day afterwards and i woke up in a bad mood too <laughs> uh point being whenever you get to that state it's very easy to have it set off uh recently uh yesterday actually i'm i feel better by the way uh, by now um i was streaming yesterday and I had a funny stream moment where I was telling people this, about that that moment. And then suddenly I got several messages uh, via Gmail telling me that people had raised the amount of money that they were donating per month from like $5 to $10 and so on. <laughs> three people did that. I definitely appreciate you three uh, and everyone else as well. But uh, that was a really funny bit that they managed to pull off. Uh, I, I, that was a, I wish I had a clip of that. That would be pretty funny. Um... 
Yes. Uh, in the process of doing all this, I started looking up like uh, solutions in addition to trying to treat my body better. I came across um, cognitive behavioral therapy. And if you don't know what that is, I don't blame you. I was looking it up, and coincidentally, I found the Reddit for cognitive behavioral therapy. And uh, one of the first things that you'll find there is a thread saying, people often confuse this with a certain sexual fetish. <laughs> because CBT, cock and ball torture. <laughs> I had to explain that to my girlfriend. It's like, w what is with CBT? What's that? I said, oh, whenever you want to get better, you have to explore CBT. Like, oh, I get it now. Um, but the whole idea is that you have to try to change the way that you think. You have to change the way that you frame things. Uh, you have unhealthy thinking, and there are ways of getting around that to change your outlook. So just listening to that and listening to people talk about how they had their own depression and things like that uh, helped me a lot. Uh, some people, whenever they are depressed, they don't want to hear about other people being depressed, because why would they? Uh, but sometimes, actually, for people like me, it kind of helps in a weird way. Because, you know, it does give you that sense that other people are going through it as well. Um, and with mine, mine, I'm probably making too big of a deal out of it. Like, as far as it being like a ranking for like 1 to 10, I wouldn't... It, it's like it topped out at like a 5 or a 6. It wasn't that bad. Right now, I'm at like a 2 or 1. I'm fine. Um, but one of the things I found funny is that there are bad therapists that don't really apply CBT correctly. Ah, uh -huh, see what I did there. Um, <laughs> that don't apply cognitive behavioral therapy correctly. And as a result, it feels like they're gaslighting you. Like, take for example someone that is depressed because they have chronic pain. Uh, I saw someone complaining about this, that he was effectively being gaslit by his therapist because they were trying to say, uh, why do you have depression? And he would say, because I have chronic pain. Like, I think in his case, like, something was wrong with his foot. He had surgery or something. And the therapist kept reiterating, uh, well, which one of these, um, what are they called? Um, distortions. Uh, cognitive, cognitive distortions. Which one of these cognitive distortions do you think you have that makes you think that? And it's like, no, it is not a cognitive... I actually have chronic pain. And because of their training, they just kept reiterating, well, okay, but which one of these distortions... Because, you know, they were just trying to plug and play the problem. They weren't actually listening. So there are really bad applications of CBT. In fact, I would contend that most applications of cock and bull torture a bit. Um, but yes, um, when it comes to those sorts of things... It takes a delicate touch. Uh, there's lots of reasons why we feel these things, and the application of how to fix them can be very wonky. Case in point, my thing with the cold. I, in, on some days, I found that just taking a heating pad and just putting it on my body, for some reason, made it go away. Because I realized that once it hit like 6 o'clock in the morning... Uh, the sun was coming up and the house started heating up because it was it was pretty cold in the house. Um, that suddenly I started feeling better and I couldn't figure it out. And then I realized, oh, it's this weird association with the heat. I, I don't really understand it. But even that little bit was helping. Uh, it wasn't the solution, but, you know, it helped. This, there's weird little things about that where it can be half chemical, half mental, or, you know, the ratio could be different. It just depends on what you are, you are personally going through. Which is why... If I had more money, I would probably go to a therapist, but, you know, it's really not... This is probably the old-fashioned male mentality since I was born in 1982. I have a very old fogey mentality about this. Like, oh, it's not that bad. But, you know, for if you can go, go. Um, the, the way that the world works definitely has changed in my lifetime. Used to, if you went to a therapist, like, oh, there's something wrong with them. It, it was definitely that sort of a... Uh, mentality that others carried with it. But yeah, um, we, I have found that it, this has become more of a thing as I've gotten older. Uh, it is true that adults start to have more anxiety as they get older because there's more to worry about, of course. But also, I, I think 
I don't know how much research has been d- done in, into it, but I think a lot of it also is just it's just chemical. Um, you very rarely hear about someone having all their worries just wash away as they get older, unless they've gotten so old that they're like, oh, it doesn't fucking matter anymore. <laughs> um, but I do feel like a, there is like a chemical changes in the brain that everyone gets that just makes it to where they can not uh, really orient themselves as they get older. And I'm sure a lot of it also is like a pragmatic solutions as well. This is one of those weird things I've noticed. I'd like to actually read more about it, if I could find uh, something like that. Um, but coinciding with that, I've realized it's very important to have other people in your life as you get older. Uh, it's, it's true just in general. Like You don't have to be older for this to be true. But it's something you definitely realize as you keep getting older and older. Uh, you, a, a family especially. Uh, some people would just have really shit family that they can't rely on. And that is unfortunate. It's not fair. It's it, very not fair to you at all. Um, and you know, this is one more way that, you know, life just is taking a squat on you specifically. I know that feeling. Don't don't worry about that. Uh, but especially family, if you have it, just don't let it go if they're worth keeping. Uh, don't throw family away. Um, the older that you get, the harder it is to create communities of people. And that's how people are wired. We're wired to be in these little villages of like a hundred or so people. That's how we evolved. Uh, so you trying to live on your own inside of a, like a cold, dark room, just, you know, talking to people over Discord, sure it might work for a while, but that's not really how people are meant to live. And we're, despite where, if you're like, no, no, I'm fine, I'm not, I'm different. You're really not. Everyone needs that to some degree. Um, and as you get older, it's harder and harder to just find people like that because everyone is so wrapped up with their own family lives at that point. And coinciding with that, the more anxiety that you end up getting, uh, the more you have a tendency to push away friends, which becomes another problem. Uh, because, you know, you have this mental thing of, well, no one wants to be around me. You know, I just would bring them down and so on. So you create all these reasons why you should push people away. And the more that you push them away, the more that becomes a reason why you should keep them away. Because, oh, it's been too long. So, you you know, you just create all these reasons that seem logical to you. Whereas your friend is just like, no, shut the fuck up. Get over here. Watch some dumb bullshit with me. Let's get back to what we were. So whenever, you, like, you should be spending a lot of time trying to cultivate friendships and keep your family close to you in some regards and just cultivating it over the years. And that's hard to do, but it is something that everyone should be concerned about. Uh, You're going to miss that whenever you get older. Especially if a friend has something like um, like a avoidant personality disorder, for example. Um, Someone like that will run away from conflict. Like they'll they might fly to another country to live there to try to get away from the problem that they have because they just, they, they have a personality disorder. They just can't confront things unless they feel like they're backed into a corner and they can't run anymore. And for people like that, um, friendship may end up becoming impossible for them because even the slightest amount of conflict, like they need to be coddled constantly. And the moment that you stop coddling them, and there's even the slightest hint that there might be some sort of thing that they've done that they might be, you know, uh, liable for, or that they should apologize for. They won't do it, and they'll run away. You know, whether that is literally running away, like moving, or whether it's just, like, isolating themselves and refusing to do anything except for play video games or look at their phone or whatever it happens to be. And that... People like that will create even more barriers for themselves. Like, oh, it's been so long, I never apologized. The thing I did was so bad that it requires apology, but I can't bring myself to do that, and so on, so forth, and so on. It just creates more and more barriers and more and more conditions for what all the hoops that they would have to jump through in order for the friendship to get back to the point where they think it would be okay that they just don't do it anymore. People are like that. It's it's just so fucked up. The things that we do to ourselves. You have to confront issues. For, you know, some people that have like a personality disorder, yeah, it's, it's a huge problem. And uh, I don't mean to undermine that, but for all of us, we all have to confront issues at some point. Uh, you can't run away from them. That is like the solution 
to a lot of cognitive issues is actually confronting them on some level, like having the power to overcome them. And that takes confidence. It's one of the reasons why we're so wired to like being around people that are confident in themselves. It inspires us, sure, but it's a good indicator that they have their head on straight and that they are succeeding in some way and we're wired to know, oh, if I stick with this person, I'll be okay. But confidence stems from success. I did not have, like in my case, I had a father that, that undermined everything that I did. So I never had the chance to have confidence whenever I was growing up. And it took me being effectively just left alone and, you know, abandoned in a way, uh, for me to be able to have enough time to actually create my own su uh, successes so that I could actually get confidence. Because, you know, confidence stems from minor successes. And unfortunately, you can't succeed without also failing. So it can you can get into that cycle again of just undermining yourself over and over again because you're trying to do these huge major things because you feel like you're running out of time, but you need to start small. Uh, small failures are the key, unfortunately. So uh, try small things. Like, for example, my D uh, DM thing, people wanting me to like GM a D&D &D game. It sounds like a good idea, but I can't just jump into it. So I've started with, with small things, like, for example, that video about 10, my first D&D &D character, which went very well. Then I did another follow-up campaign that I didn't tell anyone about, but it was like a edgelord cat man that had no dexterity, so he kept falling every time he tried to climb a cliff. It was actually pretty funny. Uh, it was a, that was a good little mini campaign. Um, but yeah, these one or two session campaigns actually worked out very well. But you have to start start very small, make small failures, not small successes, make small failures. Then you'll make uh, small successes and just keep building on those. The more that you succeed, the more that you're going to learn that you are capable, and the more capable you are, the bigger attempts that you can make, and so on. It all builds on itself. You, you just have to focus on creating a good foundation for yourself. Um, the thing, like in life, we all have our like motivations on what we want to do. The thing I want more than anything else is this idea that I want to help other people, especially younger people, you know, young younger people that are sort of like me in the sense that they didn't get what they needed to actually have a successful life starting out. If I had been raised by someone different, maybe then things would have gone better for me. Maybe I would be a scientist now instead of <laughs> drawing furry women. Who knows? Maybe I would do both. Um, but all of us need help, and I like the idea of trying to help other people. But I'm not a therapist. And sometimes I have this fear that I'm more like a motivational speaker. And I don't really have a lot of respect for motivational speakers because they don't really fix anything. They will make you feel good for a few days because they give you a high. But after that, you just go back to normal because nothing actually changed. You might be like motivated to try to have more agency in your own life or whatever, and you'll start trying to make small changes, but it doesn't really feel like it's lasting. But whenever I start thinking about that, I had to remind myself that ultimately I can't fix anyone but me. And that's true of everyone. Only you can fix your own life. Like even with a, like a romantic partner or whatever. Uh, partners are partners. They're not anchors. They're not foundations that you build your life on. It has to be a partnership. So you have to have your own life with its own successes, its own failures. And they have to have yours or their own. And then you link those two lives together. Because you are partners. That's the whole idea. But in trying to establish all these things in your own life, no one's going to reach out to random people. Like, I, I, I got that terrible advice. Like, Paige gave me that terrible advice, like, years ago. Of, oh, how do I improve my life? And her ad amazing advice was to, like, move to a random city, because this is something that she would do move to a random city and to start trying to make friends with random people. Awful advice. Never do that. It's one of the dumbest things I've ever heard. Um, whenever you form connections with other people, it's going to be based on something. It doesn't matter if it's a hobby. It doesn't matter if it's like a you share the same interests in a similar movie. It, it's all going to stem from, oh, I like being around this person in some way. It doesn't have to be like this amazing life-altering relationship or anything, but you still have to dislike being near them in some fashion. Uh, all relationships, no matter what they are, should be genuine in some way. So in the course of like trying to improve your life and form these connections, I understand the difficulty in reaching out because you're not really sure who to reach out to or what direction to reach out. 
this is completely understandable. Um, so whenever people have been suggesting to me, oh, just bring on, like if you're going to do a podcast or you're going to do a DM session, bring on random patrons of a certain tier. That's a terrible idea because <laughs> you don't know them. You don't know if someone's going to start dropping in bombs one day or something, or if they're going to start bringing up their love of uh, Nazi paraphernalia or just some weird thing like that. You don't know them. And there's no basis for a genuine relationship or a rapport between the, the two of you. Other than, than, you know, they gave you money one time. And that's not the basis for anything. So in exploring those ways of, you know, bettering your life, that's one of the things you have to worry about. <clears throat> uh, random guests are a bad idea for the same reason. As far as being on a podcast. You want that rapport, and you can't have that rapport if you don't know them in some way. In the same vein, if you reach out to people that you do like, and then they reject you for some reason, you know, that also feels bad. You know, I've, I've had that happen with uh, other content creators, where I really like what they do, and I feel like we would get along, then I try to contact them, and I get, you know, either iced, or they say, yeah, 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 and then I'll send them a few messages, and they just, you know, ghost me. That happens. It actually happens a lot, if you think about it. Most people that you run into are going to be people that don't really want to interact with you. This is just life. Uh, life, again, is trying and creating a community and resources and family and just trying to hold on to them. Life in general is just changing yourself while holding on to what you like and reclaiming the things that you lost. Like, for example, this sort of podcast uh, is more, it's way more sappy and kind of em emotional, I guess, than something that I would have made whenever I first started. I used to be way more silly and irreverent and mocking and kind of biting. People loved my mocking humor and the my quotable videos and when it comes to just talking to them in the same way that I'm talking to you now, they don't really care as much for that. They like the surface level of who I am. But when it gets to the deeper levels, then they want to leave. And that's not something unique to me, that's just people. That's everyone. There's probably been people in your own life that you may be guilty of this as well, where they will reveal some deeper aspect to themselves, or it'll seem like they're changing in some way, but they're just opening up a little bit. And you might feel uncomfortable being around them at that point. And as a result, you may just leave their life in some fashion. Um, I'm not going to say that's a good thing, but I'm not going to say it's a bad thing either. That's just life. It's just how things are. Um, you have to establish what you're comfortable with and make sure that your life is being led according to what you feel most comfortable doing and what you actually enjoy doing. You can't be anchored to anyone or chained to the idea of what things should be. You have to live according to your life. Um, something a lot of you may know is, uh, I've, I very rarely cry in any way. Um, it's just not something I really do. And here we go, final picture. Um, I've cried a few times in front of very, very few people. Uh, I've, I can probably count the number of times I've cried in one hand, unfortunately. Uh, or fortunately, depending on how you look at it. Um, in those few times where I've done that, some have abandoned me because I became a bother to them for that reason. And in hindsight, those friendships that I thought I had were fake. They just weren't really authentic. And uh, the more that I've that time has passed, the more that I've had more like a distant view of what those friendships were, the more I realize how much of a waste of time that they actually were. Like they were just completely inauthentic, and what little I got out of them, I put more into it than I ever got back. And I should not have bothered wasting my time on them. That kind of betrayal can recontextualize the whole friendship. Uh, to that end, I will probably never trust those people ever again. Someone who apologizes, and this has happened as well, because I uh, have like broken before, and because uh, I've just put up with too much, and... Once they realize that and realize how far it's gone, for someone that apologizes and then tries their best, that tries much harder to support me and change the way that they have done things, then I will double down and support them even more. That's how I am. Not everyone is like that, I understand. 
but th there is always like a breaking point in every sort of friendship or community in which you realize this is authentic, this is real. Especially as a man, since we're expected to be these fortresses, these emotional fortresses that just don't feel anything but positive vibes, and we always support everyone else, but we never have needs of our own. Especially for someone like me, you know, because I've always built up walls around myself and so on. But when it comes to, like, trying to better our own lives, and as we get older, and as we're creating all these little resources and communities around us, it is vital that we choose our own battles and accept the fact that we are always going to be making mistakes. And in the process of making these mistakes, we're also just being better people as a result, or we sh should be trying to be. Um... Case in point, this podcast. Not the cleanest podcast, but it was a, it was a try. It was my first try. So <laughs> maybe one day I'll do a, a more authentic podcast that has like guests and we'll, it'll be like produced and it'll have an intro song. Or maybe I'll never do that at all. I'll just talk about it. Who knows? Who knows? Because that's what life is when it comes down to it. It's just exploring new ideas, trying new things. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. But the point is, is that... I should be doing things that I enjoy, and I should be around people that I enjoy being around. Because ultimately, that's what life really is about. And that's what podcasts are really about. It's about talking about or doing the things that you actually enjoy. And if people pick up on that, then they will enjoy it as well. As long as you're being authentic, and this is probably the thing that's most important to me in regards to my own personality, being authentic. As long as you are being authentic, it doesn't matter if everyone likes you or not. It, d it doesn't matter if someone's donating a, a dollar instead of five dollars a month. <laughs> um, as long as you are being authentic and being real and enjoying your life, people will pick up on it. And the people that have like-minded interests will show up. They eventually will be there. As long as you keep making yourself known. You have to reach out. And you will be hurt as a result. But eventually, you will also be cared for. As long as the people that you choose to have in your life are good people, they will absolutely care for you. And you have to also be be willing to accept the fact that they are willing to care for you. Which is something that a lot of us struggle with. Being able to accept that other people are willing and able to help us. Just <laughs> accept that part of it as well. Uh, case in point, this drawing. Uh, I did the whole drawing in one direction, and then at the very end I flipped it once and went, hmm, that actually looks better on the other side. And I asked uh, as chat. It's like, which one of these do you actually prefer? And my girlfriend said, I actually like it better the other way. So I said, you know what? I agree. So I completely flipped the drawing, completely altered it permanently, and I, I like it better as a result. Worked out just fine. Okay. Anyways, enough of that. Hope you enjoyed my faux podcast. Hope you enjoyed Winnie. I like to have her show up at least once a year. She go is going through her own changes. Maybe one day I'll draw her going through menopause. <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> Maybe not. Uh, she'll always be young and beautiful, just like, just like God intended. Actually, just like the artist intended. Just like Daddy intended. Oh god, no, none of that. Okay, I'm, I'm sorry. Uh, hope you guys enjoyed this podcast. I'll see you next time. Next Winnie. Next October. Next week, maybe. Bye-bye.